Today is February 26, 2015, and this is a short program of video documentation I made in Columbus, Georgia on February 10th, taking a look at what I'm sure now is the oldest Terea taxifolia tree in the world, and that means, of course, Florida Terea in the southeastern United States. Columbus, Georgia, I wasn't even sure it even existed anymore. The last time I'd heard from people about it was 2009. I'd never visited it before, and at that time they reported uh, that it looked pretty diseased. So the two people who reported on it in 2009, you can actually read what they said on our website, tereaguardians.org. Just click on the Georgia link in there and scroll down until you see the Columbus, Georgia tree. One was Leigh Brooks, and let me actually read to you what Leigh Brooks said. Leigh Brooks emailed Terea Guardians this correspondence from her colleague Jerry Adams from Bainbridge, Georgia in May 2009. So Leigh didn't see the tree herself, but her colleague emailed her. Stop by Columbus, Georgia the other day and two of the three Terea trees that grew on the river just south of downtown have been cut down. The remaining one is still living but very diseased. The next door neighbors said the house with the two trees changed hands about six years ago and they cut them down. I last saw the three trees in 2002 and of the two that got cut down one was in really good shape. Mark Garland told me about the trees. He grew up in Columbus. Mark Garland is a respected botanist in Florida. So again, there used to be three mature trees all on the same place, Front Street, a very historic neighborhood in Columbus, Georgia. But by the time 2009 came around, the two healthiest ones had already been cut down. So there was only one left as of 2009, and nobody had contacted me since then about whether it still existed. A few months actually before Leigh Brooks contacted me, the owner of the house, Fred Fusell, contacted me, sent me an email, and here's what he said. At the very moment that we returned home today from a weekend visit to see our kids in Oxford, Mississippi, we spotted a stranger on our front porch, one with Lafayette County, Mississippi license plates on his car. He was knocking on our front door. It turned out to be Edward Croom, Jr., Ph.D., who was here hoping to photograph our Torea. Ed had no clue that you and I had corresponded about the tree during the past two weeks. He was actually on his way to the Atlanta Botanical Garden to see other examples of Torea and made a side trip to Columbus. As it happens, Ed and I have many, many other common interests and connections. However, he had seen and documented our tree and two others on our street in Columbus several years ago. Unfortunately, the other two were destroyed a few years ago. What a wild coincidence. I don't think Fred is living there anymore. Someone else has moved in and renovations were going on in the home when we arrived there. Now, Edward Croom, I, as I recall, he's the grandson of the famous Croom uh, for which a, a, a genus Crumia is named after, um, the genus has one endangered species in the Apalachicola River area where Florida Terea is also endangered. So this is really significant having this correspondence and as you'll see in the videos that follow, about 12 minutes that follow, it was quite a day for me too. Heading south down to Columbus. Now when we cross Columbus over uh, into Alabama, across the Chattahoochee River, that's going to be the corridor for the Tories, but you can see how flat it is up here. This is the pine woods up here, just pure pine on sand. Certainly nowhere here that uh, Tory could possibly ever making its way and would have to come up to the Chattahoochee River. To the right and two miles. Yes, ma'am. But we came down a little bit of a hill there, so here's the situation. So there must be a canyon. Well, let me take a picture of that. Okay. So here. Oh yeah. Okay. 
Okay. You can see the bridge going over the river. We're going to turn left onto Front Avenue. It's actually Broadway. Oh, Broadway. Okay. So we're turning left onto Broadway. The river's straight ahead there. We've still got one street to go over. Right to get turn in. Wow. One point. One miles oh, on that beautiful miles oak. This is a beautiful street. This must have been. Look at these gorgeous oaks. Yeah, nice. Okay. Yeah. Well, there's a nice. This is downtown nice Columbus. Oak. It looks to me like it's a laurel oak. When I look at the bark, it's definitely not a live oak. It goes up too tall fast. So I think we're in laurel oak. And since it's, uh, since here we are February and the leaves are still on the trees, it can't be a willow oak. So let us pronounce it a laurel, whole line of laurel oaks. Very nice. Okay. So I'm going to take a look down here and see what the river looks like across there. Yeah, you can see it goes down into a canyon there. Now uh, Broadway has turned into the, right looks turn like the original bridge. Five miles on West 5th Street. I'll make a right over here. Okay, right so that'll take us down to front, which is as close as you can get to the river. That is really good to know. So those three trees that were reported, oh gosh, six years ago? Um, right on eight. Right on eight. Okay, here we go. They could easily have been growing there naturally, and then people built their houses. Approaching left turn. With the trees on keeping them there. Front Avenue. Could have been very old. Oh yeah, this is. <laughs> wow. Look at that great. That's a wonderful right canyon. Down there, yeah, you just gotta circle around. If it's one okay. Approaching right turn. On Broadway. Trolley. Okay, here we are to the brick road again. Yeah, that's a nice oak. It looks like deciduous oak. Maybe it's a willow oak. Approaching right turn on the West Fifth Street. Whoa, yeah. Yeah. I don't see any for sale signs. This is still a viable neighborhood. A lot of deciduous here. Ooh, I wonder if this is a live oak. Look at that. Got the bark of a live oak. Hello, live oak. Oh, man, here's another beautiful laurel oak straight ahead. All right, so here we're trying again. Oh, oh, oh. oh Approaching my destination gosh. on the right. These, I'm sure these three Tories would have been growing naturally in the houses built around them. We'll come back and take a look off the edge here and look down in the river as soon as we find a place to park. Well, 538 front. Yeah, 538 front. That's 510. You have arrived. 538. Front Avenue. Approaching right turn. There's 536. Five, 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 My God, look at the Southern Magnolia. Oh. Beautiful. What is that there? Oh, that's a Tory. That's it. Oh, okay, let's get out and take a look. Oh my gosh. It doesn't look any less healthy than the picture because it already lost its top. Okay, it doesn't look like anybody's here, but look at this. National Register of Historic District. This home was built in 1892 and so Oh my gosh, if this is, this has got to be, this is ancient. Yeah, that's old, that's old this old. is original, they didn't even plant this here. This was growing before Columbus even came into being. Now here from the porch, look across, there's a gazebo there, we'll walk down to the river, but we're gonna take a close up look at this Tory. What a glorious tree, what a glorious. Yeah. 
I'm definitely going to, I'm going to get out the knife. I'm going to collect some branchlets, quickly get it into water, and see if we can root. See if we can root this. The one on the right here has no reproductive structures on it at all. These two on the left do. <clears throat> the one on the farthest left is the top side of the needles. And the one on the right I flipped over to see the underside. So let's take a close look at each of them. Here are the reproductive structures. And then here are the reproductive structures on the underside. Look at the double light colored line under the underneath of the leaf. Here's another close up of the reproductive structures again just on the upper two branches there. This one has it on the underside. And this one has it on both branchlets, kind of spread out there. On the upper side. So here's another view of Front Avenue. This is to the north of the Terea. Very historic section here. And there's our van packed by parked by 538, which looks like it's under construction inside, that no one's living there right now. And there you get a good view of that gorgeous Southern Magnolia and the Torea that used to be taller. There you can see, you can see how it had a nice top to it. It's died back. But boy, the rest of its leaves look, look fine. So there's our van. There's the giant Southern Magnolia, and you can see the Terea just to the left of it. Here comes Michael. Obviously, this is quite a historic district here. And I'm standing right on the edge of where the drop-off is, the natural drop-off, though it's been sculpted here, down to the Chattahoochee River. So this is one of the few places where we've got, you can see the free-flowing water here. Uh, there's no dam close enough downstream to have turned this into a lake. This is still the river. Uh, but you can get a, a, a view of the topography here. There's another bridge crossing there. Uh, this would definitely be the same sort of rich soil piled up from floods uh, that the Chattahoochee River draining the southern Appalachians would have brought down here. Very, very similar to what we have in the Apalachicola uh, in the Florida Panhandle. So here again, looking downstream, and turning to look up here, 538 Front Street, the one remaining Terea taxifolia. Here in Columbus, Georgia. Over on the other side, of course, that's, that's Alabama, another state that starts in there. This would have been the corridor. This would have been the corridor that Terea taxifolia back and forth and back and forth for as long as this river existed during all the previous glacials and interglacials would have traveled from the Appalachians way up there to the north down. Sacred site. Sacred site, exactly. The pilgrimage that Terea taxifolia had been making. Who in the heck knows where it was before the Pleistocene, Pliocene, uh, certainly back in the Jurassic, this area wouldn't have even existed. So that's my video report. Uh, not only was I delighted that the tree still existed, but you can see by taking a site visit, I came up with a hypothesis that had just never occurred to me before. And that is, I had seen the pictures of the tree, 
but I had not seen any pictures of someone simply turning around and taking a picture that, duh, the Chattahoochee River was right behind it there. Uh, that, of course, meant that I started thinking from a deep time perspective. I had known that the Apalachicola was the lowermost section of the, where the Chattahoochee drained into, and I had intuited that the Chattahoochee would have been the primary corridor that Torea traveled back and forth and back and forth north and south during the climate shifts that it's gone through. But actually being on site let me think that perhaps this particular tree, unlike the ones in the Biltmore, unlike the one that was in Norlina, North Carolina, um, that these trees, the three of them that originally had been there and the one that was left, perhaps were actually native to the land. That is that they might actually have simply been, had houses built around them rather than having purchased them from a nursery that had gotten them from seed stock in Florida and so forth. Doing the calculations, given that the, um, the house where it was at was a historic house that was built in 1892, perhaps the tree was 20 years old when the house was going up. It was a nice little tree. They decided to leave it there and build the house behind it. That would mean that today, if it had been young in, say, 1870 or so, would be about 150 years old. So the question becomes, how can we determine whether this tree really is 150 years old before any nurseries were supplying any landscaping trees into the area? Is it possible the tree is that old? Well, as it turns out, I did not get out my tape measure. I did not measure the diameter. I should have done that. Um, but I'm going to show you pictures here that we can compare the size of this tree to some of the other known trees that I've been to. Most importantly, let's compare the size of this particular Torea, um, using my husband as a scale factor for it, to one of the Torea trees uh, that I took a photograph in of in 2006 at the Biltmore Estates. And we know, we know that they were brought there probably as small seedlings by Chauncey Beetle in 1939. So the tree is now around 70 years old. So here's a photo side by side of Michael, 2015, standing by the tree in Columbus, Georgia, the hypothesis being that it might be at least 150 years old, compared to the then 70-year-old tree at the Biltmore Estate that's got a standard size water bottle sitting in front of it. What do you think? Now I'll show you one more comparison or a set of comparisons. Uh, I've visited several, actually five different sites of the sister species of the Florida Torea, and that is the California Torea. They're all located in the mountains of California. The biggest ones I found were in the, uh, actually quite at sea level, but a sea level valley that's consistently filled with fog, so there's no drought, north of Santa Cruz. These were really, in fact, the champion trees there. So I'm going to show you a couple pictures that I took back in, I think it was 2005, where I was visiting the California sites. I don't know what the ages are, but take a look at how big these trees can get. That's Lee Klinger that you see standing next to the trees. And the biggest one here is the champion California Torea in California and therefore in the world. I don't know whether anyone has actually bored into any of the California trees to find out how old they are. But one thing we need to consider with respect to the Columbus tree, unfortunately my last video did not come out. I had Michael filming it and he had inadvertently turned it off, but I had a close up taking a look at the branchlets of the tree and the trunk. One whole side of the trunk, the side of the trunk facing the river, has been stripped of bark. It looks like for a very long time the edges of the bark are starting to grow round over it. But you can look up and you can see it diagonals way up to the top. Maybe it was a lightning strike that happened a number of years ago.
But the point is, is that tree has been growing with that for a very long time. And so it could actually be older than what its diameter would show because it's only had basically, oh, about 75%, if that, of the remaining bark to be able to handle the water carriage and photosynthesis that transport between the leaves and the roots. So the diameter, and certainly since it's lost bark there, the circumference of the di di diameter would actually be smaller than what you'd expect of a healthy tree of that age. I'll show a couple photographs here as good as I can find that will give you a sense that there is a problem with that side of the tree. The best one is actually the one that Fred Fusell sent me in 2009. Take a look at the photograph. I think it's the one on the right hand side here and you can actually see the distinction in the loss of bark in the graying out of the side of the trunk facing the road. So probably what it means is some expert, someone who knows how to do it without damaging the tree and therefore plugging it up to make sure no insects can get in, to actually go and bore into the healthy side of the tree and count the rings. It would be fascinating to know how old this tree is. And why that's important, why that's important is that if it turns out that this tree is at least 150 years old, maybe older than that, then the most plausible hypothesis is that this tree was growing there on its own. No one had transported anything up from the native range along the Apalachicola River in Florida. But it would be proof positive that this tree actually did have a northern part of its range. The Chattahoochee was a, an important conduit for it moving back and forth. And therefore, the assisted migration our group has already been doing to the southern Appalachian Mountains and also testing out more northern range to the north, Ohio, Michigan in particular. You can see videos of that work we're doing. Um, it would mean that there should be zero controversy about moving the tree into North Carolina and that the official scientists working with the Endangered Species Act with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, right now they have nothing in their management plan that allows their own experimentation with moving the plant north. But if we can show that this tree in Columbus is actually growing there naturally, then they'll really need to move ahead and start doing doing assisted migration too. At least that's my hope. So contact Torea Guardians if you've got any information or any suggestions on how we can test the hypothesis of whether the Columbus tree really is as old as I think it might be.